Dear audience, good afternoon. I'm Maria Reisaki, Associate Professor in Pediatric Radiology at the University Hospital of Heraklion, Greece, and Chair of the ESPR Education Committee. On behalf of ESPR, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on inner ear malformations, Dr. Felice Darko, Great Ormond Street, Hospital UK. During the lecture, feel free to submit questions or comments through the chat function, which lies at the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And please do not forget to state your country of origin so that we appreciate the geographic distribution of our active audience. Questions will be answered during the discussion section. Please allow me to introduce our moderation, moderator, Dr. Atta Siddiqui, who is consultant neuroradiologist at King's College Hospital, Guy's and St. Thomas Hospitals, including the Evelina London Children's Hospital since 2008. Dr. Siddiqui completed the Pan-London Neuroradiology Fellowship before starting his consultant post. His many main subspeciality areas of interest within neuroradiology are pediatric neuroimaging and head and neck imaging, and he's an active participator in several weekly multidisciplinary relevant meetings focused on both adult and pediatric neuro, orbital and ear, nose and throat imaging. Dr. Siddiqui has extensively written and presented numerous scientific publications and he has been awarded Outstanding Presentation Award at ASNR and Certificate of Merit Awards at RSNA, among other awards, and is also a reviewer for scientific journals, including Clinical Radiology and British Journal of Radiology. Dr. Siddiqui is a keen teacher an invited speaker at regional, national, and international meetings, apart from weekly formal teaching sessions to local trainees. He's a panel member and coordinator for the FRCR exams and a panel member of several Royal College of Radiologists committees. Dr. Siddiqui is a member of the Royal College of Radiologists, British Society of Neuroradiologists, the European Society of Head and Neck Radiology, and a council member of the British Society of Head and Neck Imaging. I'm now kindly requesting Dr. Siddiqui to take over, introduce the session and our speaker. Thank you very much, Maria. And that was a, a very flattering introduction. Um, it, good evening, everyone. And it gives me immense pleasure to introduce my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Felice Darko, who is an exceptional uh, neuroradiologist uh, based in London with me. I have the pleasure of working with him at uh, Guys in St. Thomas's and Evelina Children's Hospital, and he also works at uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. Felice did his initial training in Italy at uh, the University of uh, Federico II of Naples in Italy. He completed his general radiology training uh, in Naples and then spent one year at University Hospital of Leuven, Belgium, deepening his knowledge in advanced MR imaging techniques. He then moved to Canada, completed a pediatric neuroradiology fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada in 2015, and was subsequently appointed as a consultant uh, at Great Home Street Hospital in London. He has a number of uh, research interests, uh, including MR, uh, advanced MR techniques in pediatric brain tumors. He has an interest, uh, a special interest and a passion in inner ear malformations, especially pathologic radiologic correlation. Uh, and also has an interest in neurovascular disorders. He provides peer review for a number of journals, including Clinical Imaging, Radiologia Medica, Journal of Computer Assisted Tomography, Neuroradiology, among several others. He has numerous talks, presentations, uh, and papers to his credit. And um, I've collaborated with him on a number of uh, papers on inner ear malformations. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome um, my colleague and dear friend Felicia Diarco, who will take the stage now and take us through a, a whirlwind tour of inner ear malformations. Over to you, Felicia. Thank you, Ada, for the introduction and also for uh, uh, the European Society of Pediatric Radiology for the invitation. Um, I, really, as Ada said, uh, I, um, I I got involved uh, and uh, and interested in. Uh, um, sensory near and hearing loss uh, and in particular uh, in um, inner ear malformation. So what I would like to present you today is a new uh, classification of the inner ear malformation but even most more importantly I would like to show you how looking at the ear we can actually 
have some important information about the genetic abnormalities involved and syndromic association. So uh, looking at specific uh, uh, phenotypes in the year, uh, we can uh, actually think of a syndromic association and look at other parts of the body. So I think that despite this is an, uh, a niche uh, kind of uh, a area, we really need as pediatric radiologists or neuroradiologists, we need to um, understand um, uh, how to diagnose the malformation of the ear. So um, uh, I will start with the basic, and this is a very important uh, uh, paper um, uh, from, uh, uh, from Joshi and, and uh, et al. in Radiographic in 2012. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, they describe the inner ear malformation as a spectrum of malformation. And as you can see in this table, the um, later is the um, age of development when the insult um, happened, the um, less uh, uh, um, marked is the malformation. So uh, uh, the other way around, the earlier the, the insult, the more striking and marked and, and the complex is the malformation. Uh, as you can see here, however, uh, the, all the development of the, of the ear is um, um, uh, at that point was considered between the third and the seventh week of gestation. So after the seventh week, nothing can happen. Uh, but actually, the situation of the, uh, the the embryology of the temporal bone and in particularly of the inner ear is actually much more complicated. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an interesting picture, the uh, photograph that I liked very much. It's called the reflection complexity of life. And uh, if you, if the more we know about embryology in general and about about the connection between the phenotype and the genotype in, in radiology, as radiologists in general, not only for the inner ear, the more we understand. Uh, uh, things and the more we, under we, we understand what's going on behind um, the, 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 the simple phenotype that we report. To account for this complexity when it comes to inner ear malformation, for instance, before we thought that the, the, the cochlear development was completed at seven gestational weeks, but if you study the embryology, we um, then uh, uh, realized that the complete cochlear development finished when the, um, uh, at, at, at mid the gestation, so 25 weeks more or less. And why this is so important? This is not just uh, uh, days to remember, it's because some of the malformations that I will show you that are called uh, cochlear hypoplasia uh, are um, um, uh, due to a stop during the development of the cochlea that goes from the beginning of the labyrinth development to the 25th uh, week. And depending on the, the, the appearance of this cochlear hypoplasia, we can really do a different diagnosis, sometimes a genetic diagnosis, or we can think of a syndromic association. So that's very important. Another important thing is that after the labyrinth is completed, we have the mesenchyma around the labyrinth that then ossifies. And if we have problem in the ossification, we have uh, some malformation, a group of malformation that are called incomplete partition. And I will show you a lot of examples. Uh, but this process of ossification, again, goes on and on uh, till the 20th, 23rd weeks uh, of gestation. And uh, um, if we identify some specific uh, uh, incomplete partition, we can actually uh, uh, diagnose the, the um, uh, we can do a genetic diagnosis sometimes. The only part of the ear that develops after birth, so the, the, the Audi capsule and the, the ear morpho, inner ear morphology uh, at, at birth is the same, including the size from, from birth to, uh, to adult um, hood, but uh, the, the vestibular aqueduct can develop even uh, um, some years after birth. So that's important because another class of malformation are characterized by dilated vestibular aqueduct. So these are just examples that you don't really need to remember, but it's just to show you that there's more to the picture than meets the eye. And 
we also know that now there are a lot of uh, information about genotype phenotype correlation and if we look at the, the the gene families that are involved in the development of the otic capsule uh, otic uh, placode they are very very important sox dix fgf fox we have these uh, um, families involved in a lot of condition and that's uh, so important because allow us to connect the dot between abnormality in the ear and abnormality in other parts of the body. On top of that, some specific genes are specific for the development of specific part of the inner ear. For instance, Pax2 genes, and again, you don't need to remember that, but you need to remember that some genes like Pax are involved specifically in the development of the cochlea. So sometimes we have cochlear aplasia and I wish, or hypoplasia, and I will show some example again, in an otherwise normal inner ear. And uh, uh, the same happened for the anterior and posterior semicircular canal that can be lost with DIX5 and other genes involved in the lateral semicircular canal. These genes, I told you, they have function in other parts of the body development. And this is an example that was published by Gosh team uh, in which uh, a specific combination of distal renal tubular acidosis plus the dilatation, you can see in this 3D format of the vestibular aqueduct with associated sensory neural deafness is uh, um, due to a FOXC1 mutation, so a gene of the Fox family. And this is another example of two parts of the body very distant, uh, but that they share the same uh, gen genotype phenotype correlation. So coming back to this uh, table, if you look at this table, apart from the uh, gestational week of origin that we, we I just uh, demonstrated you that is not uh, uh, so precise, uh, there is no pathological pathophysiological correlation, so only timing of arrest. Why, as radiologists, we need to tell the clinician, look for a gene or this is a prenatal damage. Only one type of cochlear hypoplasia that was described as a small cochlear bud and only two type of incomplete partition. But now we know that this situation is more complicated, not only in terms of gestational week of origin, but also for the number of cochlear malformation. We have three incomplete partition. These three incom the, uh, incomplete partition are completely different and have different um, uh, exiopathogenesis. So you need to recognize. and at least four cochlear hypoplasia, but actually we know now, and we are studying that um, um, there is a spectrum of cochlear hypoplasia, and some of these will be specific for specific condition. So it's not just a classification that we, we like to make, to do or to study, to make things complicated. It has a relevant, a clinical relevance. And I can assure you that once you know a bit more about that, you can do amazing diagnosis uh, based on the appearance of the inner area and it's really, really uh, simpler than, than you think. Let's start with the complete labyrinthine ablation of Michel deformity. So um, there is, this is easy, the definition is there is uh, no labyrinth whatsoever. The interesting thing is that look at this case, we can have asymmetric appearances. So uh, on one side, no labyrinth, another side, a malformation. Uh, um, a bit less uh, marked malformation, in this case, incomplete partition type 1, but we will see that afterwards. And sometimes we have no otic capsule at all. So uh, either we have uh, uh, no bone and no labyrinth, or like in this case, we have an otic capsule, so the bone that contains the labyrinth is present. There is the, a normal facial canal, but nothing inside. Uh, so there is a variation you can describe in your report, but when you have complete labyrinthine aplasia, there is at least there are at least two genes that you need to take in mind: FGF3 with Lam syndrome. So look at the here and look at the uh, at the um, uh, dance uh, so, um, at the teeth. Sorry, dance is Latin, uh, and uh, so uh, because uh, you can do a diagnosis of Lam syndrome and also OXA1 mutation that. Uh, is associated with a couple of syndrome, including hypoventilation, facial weakness. So if you see a pattern like that, keep in mind these two um, genes with syndromic association, uh, Google it uh, and ask your, your uh, clinician, is there any one of these uh, other abnormalities? And again, you can help in the diagnosis and save a lot of money. The next stage is called rudimentary autocyst. 
we have a small cyst because the embryological development, if you see the scheme, the, the, the ear start with a small cyst and then there is gemmation of other cysts that then will form the cochlea, the vestibular, semicircular canal and vestibular aqueduct. In this case, this is the first stage of the development. Look how small is the internal auditory meatus and just a single cyst. This is called rudimentary autocyst. It's important to distinguish that from, uh, from uh, complete labyrinth in aplasia. Yes, because this will not be associated, to the best of our knowledge at the moment, to specific genes, but also because, because in this case, we will have absent or small internal auditory canal, we will not have a proper eighth nerve, so the implant will not be possible, and we will, the cochlear implant, so we will, we will need to consider a brainstem implant. So that's very important. While if we have something less serious, less marked, we can have um, um, something like that, that is a common cavity. So we have a common cavity that is enlarging, so there is an attempt of the, uh, in the development of creating uh, a cochlear part and a, a vestibular uh, semicircular part, but this polarization, it, it, it stopped quite early on. So in this case, you have a, the definition is a unique cavity, before differentiation in the cochlear and vestibule. So you don't have precise differentiation, but you often have a cochlear nerve. Of course, you will need to look for it. Sometimes it's present, sometimes, most of the time it's hypoplastic, but it's possible in this case to um, do a cochlear implant. So you need to evaluate um, this possibility and you need to differentiate this from that and you need to look for the, uh, the presence of the nerve and I will show you in a bit how to do that. So these are the three uh, most uh, serious mark formation uh, and uh, then we go to another mark formation that is the cochlear aplasia um, and the cochlear aplasia is, uh, you can see here in this scheme, this is uh, when there is uh, only one cavity and then the, the, the differentiation starts in uh, um, endolymphatic sac, uh, semicircular canal, and basically uh, the, the um, uh, utriculus and sacco, what will become a vestibule. But the cochlea is our region of interest. If something happens when the cochlea is starting to develop and something happens uh, involving the genes that are polarized toward the development of the cochlea, we will have a, a fourth week that the cochlea will not develop at all or will be hypoplastic, so it depends. But the important thing is that the cochlear aplasia means genetic problem most of the time. This is a schematic drawing from Joshi, um, and uh, uh, this is cochlear aplasia, and you can see that you can have the vestibule and the semicircular canal dysmorphic and abnormal, but there is no cochlea whatsoever. These are, this is the middle ear, these are the ossicles, but it's important to note that normally when the cochlear develop, you will be in the normal anatomy, a cochlear promontory, a bulging of the um, uh, profile of the otic capsule into the tympanic cavity. That is due to the fact that there is the cochlear structure. In this case, you don't have here in yellow the cochlear promontory, while in this other case, you cannot see the cochlea because uh, there is only bone, but the cochlear promontory is present. What is the difference between these two? Is that this is a cochlear aplasia. This is actually a labyrinthitis ossificant. So there was a meningitis, there, there was inflammation, then fibrosis, ossification of the inner ear. And this is why all this area where the cochlear was supposed to be is now ossified. So we don't have, um, uh, the, so the, the cochlea is not visible anymore, but we still have the promontory. So look at this difference, and this allows you to do the differential diagnosis between these two entities. Now, most important thing, because these are new stuff, relatively new stuff, is the definition of cochlear hypoplasia and incomplete partition anomaly. Cochlear hypoplasia is every time the cochlea is small. And as I told you before, these are the stage of development of the cochlea. 1.5 turns, 8 weeks, 2 cochlear turns, 10 weeks, 2.5, so the, the final uh, size, 25 weeks more or less, depending on the embryological study, but, you know, mid-gestation more or less. Uh, and uh, um, while what is the vision of incomplete partition? is a cochlea with abnormality in the internal architecture. And the theory is that the blood flow through the internal auditory meatus, so the flow coming into the inner ear during the development, is responsible for the 
um, normal partitioning of the cochlea. And if you have some problems in the normal partitioning of the cochlea, uh, meaning that there, there were some problem in the blood coming into this. And why it's important? Because a lot of insults or not genetic causes can give you incomplete partition, but not only, sometimes also genes can give you that. So it's very important to keep in mind also this etiopathogenesis. Now, these are the four groups of cochlear hypoplasia, but we know that there are more than four identified by Senaroglu. Uh, and we have cochlear hypoplasia type 1 and type 2. They are not only small, but without complete partitioning. Now, just to refresh the anatomy, and I'm sorry, I, I think I, I, I didn't have uh, um, enough time to show you also the anatomy, but basically you have a modulus in the center, interscalar septum that divides the uh, turns of the cochlea, and in every turn you have lamina spiralis dividing scala vestibuli and scala tympani. So these are the three, ele three elements, modulus, lamina spiralis, and interscalar septum. If some of these elements are missing or hypoplastic, you have incomplete partition. So cochlear hypoplasia type 1 and type 2, small, but also with abnormal internal partitioning. 3 and 4, they are small, but the internal partitioning is relatively preserved. This is the definition from Senaroglu. This is what we use. And we have a histological correlate. You can see here cochlear hypoplasia type 1, just a small cochlear bud rounded like a cyst without anything inside. The type 2, there is a bit of internal structure, but the cochlea is small and the internal structure is not complete. A type 3, only one turn and a, and, and a bit in this case, but uh, we have uh, interscalar septum here, modulus, and lamina spiralis are present. So these are the definition. Cochlear hypoplasia type 1 and type 2 are smaller version of a cochlea with incomplete partition. Type 3 and type 4 are smaller version of a normal partition cochlea. That's the basic definition. When we can expand from that, I will just show you the, let's say, patognomonic or very typical appearances, just for you to remember. But remember that cochlear hypoplasia is much more than described by Joshi. And these are the four types. This is a paper um, the, the, that um, we wrote with Giacomo Talent in British Journal of Radiology. And you can see a small cochlear bud here, just a small cyst here without any structure, type one. Type two, one turn and a, and a half. You can see here this hypo intense area. This is a bit of internal structure but the cochlea is small, we will call cochlear hypoplasia type 2. The type 3, you can see the interscalar septum, you can see the lamina spiralis, there is the modulus somewhere, uh, not shown here, and in this case, uh, we uh, have relatively preserved internal structure, so we call it type 3. The difference between type 3 and type 4 is that the type 4 typically has a normal developed basal turn, and this has embryological reason, and just a small very hypo-developed apical part of the cochlea. Why this distinction is important? Because uh, this type 3 and type 4 refers to different genes. Now, I told you before, so cochlear hypoplasia are more common than previously thought and a small cochlea. Now, I told you before that uh, we can have, uh, we can have basically, um, so the size of the inner ear is, uh, does not change from birth to death. And, uh, so meaning that we can use measurement. And what we did uh, a few years ago, we tried to do a review of the, of the measurement of all the paper that, that, that try to measure the inner ear. Uh, also we, with Dr. Siddiqui, Giacomo Talenti and our other colleagues. And we found a lot of different measurement, but uh, some of the most reproducible one were the cochlear, so-called cochlear high in coronal, which is not the, 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 the true high of the cochlea, but it's the maximum height in a coronal plane measured perpendicular to the oval window. A normal cochlea needs to be more than 4.3, let's say 4 millimeters. If you have a doubt that the cochlea looks small, try to measure. Very, very important, the lateral semicircular canal needs to be more than 3 millimeter. And we have a lot of this plastic lateral semicircular canal, for instance, in patients with Down syndrome, uh, or we, with um, uh, craniosynostosis that uh, are not reported, and no one understands why they are deaf, for instance, uh, because uh, this is missing. And then there are a lot of different ways to measure the, the, the vestibular aqueduct. One simple way in axial, although 
not completely anatomical correct, but in axial look, you can measure at the uh, midpoint and at the operculum, and it should be one millimeter and uh, um, less than one millimeter and less than two millimeter. Without going to details, I don't like measurement too much, but this. Uh, three uh, are relatively easy and and um, and can be useful now look at this case i um we what we have in this case is uh, uh, mr and ct and we have let's start with the semicircular canal the semicircular canal is present the bony island so the 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 the, the bone um, in the middle of the semicircular canal is present here here this is just partial voluming but the bony island is here but look how small it is in comparison to this one. This, if you measure, will be less than three millimeters. This is abnormal. But the vestibule is also uh, deformed and abnormal, but let's focus on the cochlea. The cochlea is clearly separated from, from the vestibule, but the, um, the uh, so, so it's not a common cavity, um, but the cochlea has no internal structure. However, it's quite big cochlea so the, the size is normal so this is not an incomplete partition so it's not a cochlea uh, a common cavity it, sorry it's not a cochlear hypoplasia so it's not a common cavity because uh, uh, you can see the separation with the vestibule it's not uh, a cochlear hypoplasia because it's quite big and if we measure in um, in coronal we have that this will be more than four millimeters so normal size so what is that there is no internal structure whatsoever we do the parasagittal reformat, very, very important to see the nerves, and we have the seven up, and uh, the cochlear vestibular down with the, with the two branches, cochlear and vestibular, so this is the seven, this is the eight, and then the two division. So the nerves are there, meaning that we can implant. How we call that? We call incomplete partition type one. Incomplete partition type one is a cochlea of normal size, clearly distinguishable for, from the um, vestibule, but, without any internal structure. And this is the definition of incomplete partition. And the important things, these are two um, histological spacements of, 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 um, of uh, incomplete partition. And you can see there is no internal structure, clear division uh, between the cochlea and the vestibule. Uh, sometimes you have part of the modulus that is present. This is normal drawing, this is abnormal, same size, no internal structure in the incomplete partition. You can now, with the three Tesla 3DT2 uh, sequences, you can identify present, complete presence of the base of the modulus or incomplete or absent um, base of the modulus in case of incomplete partition type one. This can have a relevance, not well established in research or in terms of uh, uh, prognosis. Look at this other case. These are bilateral incomplete partition type one. Now you will notice that in this case, uh, this is uh, not uh, 3D of the, of the, of the um, inner ear. This is just a, a normal standard T2 sequence of the brain, but still looking at the, at the ear, we can identify that there is an abnormality. In this other patient, same stuff, uh, axial T2 of the brain. This looks fairly normal as far as we can tell, but in this case, we don't have the cochlea at all, so it's a cochlear aplasia, and we have a uh, um, abnormally small lateral semicircular canal. Again, the bony island is less than three millimeter in axial. So we have this morphic uh, in area characterized by absence of the cochlea and this morphic semicircular canal one side. So we have bilateral um, two malformation. Why is so important? Why I'm showing you together this? Because they had the brain for a specific abnormality in the brain, which is syntelencephaly. So syntelencephaly is a malformation of the brain when the two hemispheres are fused. And why every time we have a syntelencephaly, we, we need to look at the ear? Because we know that both of them can be, so ear malformation and syntelencephaly can be caused by this gene that is um, ZIC2. So ZIC2 is involved in the uh, class of malformation that called holoprosencephaly, and syntelencephaly, which is a subcategory, and the association between syntelencephaly and uh, uh, cochlear vestibular malformation has been well established, and is because ZIC family also is involved in both the brain development and the ear development. So you see that we are connecting the dots, and every time we see something like that, we can have a look at the axial T2, we look at the ear, and we tell our consultant, well, 
there are several causes for syndrome in children, but I, I will look at this gene. Look at this other case, five-year-old, profound bilateral sensory nearing hearing loss. Uh, this is only one side, but the other side was, com was exactly the same. Let's start with the base of the cochlea. We can see the lamina spiralis. Again, the lamina spiralis is that part that divides in every turn of the cochlea, scala vestibuli and scala tympani. We can see also the interscalar septum, that is this bone, triangular bone, that uh, divides the turns, but the upper part of the cochlea is empty. We again have dilated vestibule and lateral semicircular canal that is dysmorphic with the small bony island recurring, and also we have dilated structure here. What is that? What are these? Well, this is a dilated endolymphatic duct and sac, so basically the, what we see in, in MR of the dilated vestibular aqueduct, and this is a normal cochlea, middle and apical turn, normal uh, interscalar septum, lamina spiralis, and this you know, hypointense area at the center is the modulus. So look at the difference. The upper part is completely empty. If we look at the CT, so this is an incomplete partition type 2 with associated dilated vestibule and enlarged vestibular aqueduct, and we call it Mondini triad. Uh, it's important, yes, because some genes and some diseases like the pendred uh, are um, associated with bilateral Mondini triad, can be associated with bilateral Mondini triad. So uh, incomplete partition type 2 is a malformation of the cochlea, where again, the cochlea is not hypoplastic, normal size, you can see, if you have a doubt, you measure in corona, but the upper part is empty and is associated with abnormal vestibular and semicircular canal and dilatation of the um, vestibular aqueduct. This is the uh, CT appearance, and again, you can see how different it is from a normal looking cochlea. The trick to diagnose the incomplete partition type 2 is to look at the upper part, which is empty, but also look at the lateral part of the cochlea is smooth. There is basically no interscalar septum. Medially, you can still see the interscalar septum. You see, this is bone dividing the upper turn and the middle turn here. But here, look at the smooth profile, uh, which means that there is uh, uh, no um, uh, developed interscalar septum laterally. So when you see this profile and empty cochlea uh, in the upper part, it, think in complete partition type 2, and look for the dilated vestibular aqueduct. Oh, I call vestibular aqueduct in CT and the lymphatic duct and sac in MR, but they are the same thing. And look at the corona. The spiraliform appearance of the modulus in corona is actually underdeveloped if you compare with the normal. So have all the time a normal scan for comparison. And histologically, you can see here that basically the, the, the interscalar septum is well developed or relatively well developed uh, uh, medially, but not laterally. So uh, what is the cause for that? Well, there are a lot of theories. Some people, Senaroglu says, can be a, a problem of pressure due to the fact that there is a dilated vestibular aqueduct and the, the, the scala vestibuli is just enlarged and destroy the rest. But I mean, this is not progressive, and uh, you look at the endolymphatic sac in histology, and there is no perilymphatic space. So it's a bit strange that something without perilymphatic sp space creates you know, abnormal pressure in the vestibular aqueduct. Anyway, this is just to tell you that uh, the mechanical theory is not my favorite, but when you see incomplete partition type 2, you need to remember think genetic. In fact, there are different embryological origin of this distal interscalar septum in comparison to the proximal one. So these are different and different genes involving in their development. So this is something you should take in mind and remember the association with Pendre. And this is a beautiful paper where they correlate the, the MR and CT with the histopathology. And you can see again, just to stress the fact that the lateral uh, profile is very smooth without interscalar septum. Uh, and this is the description with this apparent band-like uh, area of low T2 uh, extending from the modulus here toward the lateral wall of the cochlea, okay? And this is uh, the histological um, picture, very beautiful, I showed you before. Um, but the important thing is that then you can apply some measurement also to that, but all this measurement uh, are all uh, either the angle, 
so the interscalar septum is flattened here, or the distance between um, the lamina spidiosus, lamina spiralis, and this abnormal band. But I mean, to be fair, you know, the measurement can be confusing. Sometimes you don't have high resolution. Just to show you that this measurement stressed the fact that the lateral aspect of the profile in the incomplete partition type 2 is smooth. This is very important. This, path, this is pattern recognition. This is a pathognomonic appearance of the ear, bilateral symmetric. When, it, when it's bilateral symmetric, think genetic, um, enlarged uh, internal auditory canal. There are the nerves going into that. No internal structure. You cannot recognize the modulus or the lamina spiralis. But look, the external structure, so some sort of interscalar septum is present. So you have this uh, uh, corkscrew appearance, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, there are other abnormalities, but this appearance of the cochlea is typical and is called incomplete partition type 3. Why is so important? Because you have a gene for that. So the incomplete partition type G has this gene, POU3F4. Sorry, the, the name is not the easiest to remember, but it's very important because you have, this is X-linked and you have a genetic diagnosis in 95% of these cases. Otherwise, it will be a COL6 uh, uh, gene. But most of the time, you see this appearance, this is genetic, this is X-linked, uh, a hearing loss, and you say to your clinician, that's the gene. 95% of the time, you will be right. On top of that, connecting the dots, look at the brain again, because all these patients, or the, a, a, a big percentage of these patients with incomplete partition type 3, so X-linked uh, deafness, will have abnormality of the hypothalamus, either an hypothalamic hamartoma or frank hypothalamic hamartoma-like lesion, or this lumpy, bumpy appearance of the profile. And uh, what is the reason? Because the uh, actually POU3F4 participate in the uh, development of the hypothalamus and the ear. So again, you see, it's not something just theoretical that some genes are involved in the ear and in the brain or other part of the body. You connect the dots and uh, you um, know where to look and you can do a, uh, a diagnosis. And of course, uh, this needs to be studied. They will check the, 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 um, the hormonal profile uh, and so on. And even more interesting, this is not all, the only case where there is an association between the cochlear abnormalities and hypothalamic abnormalities. This is, but the, there are two cases of uh, pallister hall syndrome reported, and I've seen other two uh, in my hospital where there is cochlear hypoplasia. Look, this is the normal cochlea, 3D reformat with all the, the two and a half gyre and turns. And this is an hypoplastic cochlea, bilateral symmetric, think genetic, and big uh, hypothalamic hamartoma. So there is an embryological connection between uh, hypothalamus development and cochlear development. Um, so I've shown you that there is developmental link between the inner ear, the brain, and the body, and you can give clue for you can have clues for the diagnosis looking at the ear. Now. You have typical pedus bone findings sometimes associated with findings in other body parts, including but not uh, only involving the brain, in syndromic causes of hearing loss. And this is a paper that we published um, uh, uh, with also with Dr. Siddiqui uh, in, 2000, in this year in the European Journal of Radiology. And we identified some that looking at the literature and our archive, that there are actually some specific uh, um, appearances of the petrous bone in some syndromic causes of hearing loss. This is uh, brachial autorenal syndrome. I will show you the characteristic. Look at the charge. So charge uh, is associated with dysmorphic ossicles, but also absent semicircular canal and small cochlea, so cochlear hypoplasia of different kinds, type 1, like in this case, type 2, doesn't matter. But when you see no semicircular canal, at all, think charge syndrome and look for the association with charge syndrome. So olfactory bulb and so say that are as absent, skull base abnormality and so on. I told you bilateral Mondini triad pendred. Look at this other case. You can see the, the middle turn, the apical turn. The basal turn is there, it's just not visualized in, in, in this because of partial voluming. But all these turns are present, but are like flattened, like 
they were compressed somehow, plus the lateral semicircular canal is more, again, small bony ala, the other semicircular canal are absent. In this case, these patients had also, um, ah, I will tell you afterwards because I have this case, but this is typical of SOX10. Now, this child has Hirschsprung and hearing loss, and this is exactly what I wanted to show you. Look at this case. Basal third, middle tone, apical tone, they are all there, but they are a bit flattened. Look at this aspect on CT, they are smaller. Okay. The lateral semicircular canal is small, the other semicircular canal are absent. So we have a complex malformation characterized by a cochlear hypoplasia that we call cochlear hypoplasia type 3. Why? Because it's small, but the internal structure, look at the modulus here, is present, interscalar septum present. So cochlear hypoplasia type 3, abnormality in the semicircular canal, but look, there is something else. There is a Kalman. The child has no olfactory bulbs. So now we have three elements that we can use for Google search. Hirschsprung, hearing loss due to a cochlear malformation, and Kalman disease, so absent olfactory bulbs. This is a specific syndrome, but also a specific gene. This is Wanderbrug syndrome, but we know that there are different kinds of Wanderbrug syndrome, but this association is typical of SOX10. So you can write SOX10 in your report. You can save a lot of money just looking at this association. And if you look at this paper I, I, I told you about before, uh, all this typical, so we try to describe all this typical association to facilitate your diagnosis. Look at this other case. This also can be classified like a cochlear hypoplasia type 3. We see a bit of modulus here, we see interscalar septum, but look, it looks like a, um, uh, um, how is called this? Um, uh, well, unwound they call, but it's, it's like this, uh, this clava that they, um, they use in, uh, in sometimes as a weapon, medieval weapon, so this one. Uh, and, uh, and actually, this is very typical of brachioautorenal syndrome. But brachioautorenal syndrome is uh, characterized also by um, ossicles abnormality, periauricular tags, of course, deafness. And if you, this typical appearance sometimes can be different, but when you see something like that, unwound cochlea, think of bore. And if you measure in corona, this is small. Another uh, abnormality associated with specific uh, genes and uh, also uh, associated with auricular malformation and renal abnormality. So remember that this appearance is very typical of poor. So this narrow down the genes you are looking for and trigger your attention to other parts of the body like the neck or the, the, the kidney problem. Very, very important. Cochlear hypoplasia type four, again, is a cochlear, just to show you that is bilateral and symmetric and is the by definition is every cochlea that has a, a normal basal turn and very abnormal uh, apical part of the cochlea is called cochlear hypoplasia type 4. It is associated with chromosomal abnormalities but the important point for you is that you see something like that and you think genetic because when it's asymmetric you can be it can be genetic or not but when it's symmetrical abnormality always thinks genetic. A specific type of cochlear hypoplasia type 4 we described in, uh, um, in, in this paper uh, with an with, uh, excellent colleague from, from Boston and, and, and Toronto and Professor Montoni, who is an expert in, in walker warburg syndrome. And we realized that all these patients with walker warburg syndrome, which is a syndrome characterized by the uh, cobblestone list encephaly and abnormality in the muscle, in the eye, they are very malformed brain. Uh, they have uh, uh, all of these patients with very bad brain phenotype, they have a cochlear hypoplasia type 4 with the normally development uh, basal term and just a bit of apical turn and also, you know, uh, displaced anteriorly. And this is the comparison with the normal cochlea. Why this is important? I mean, these children, they have terrible brain malformation. So this, the fact that the, the, the cochlea is malformed is the last of their problem. But the important thing is that because we don't know precisely what is the genotype phenotype correlation in uh, this group of disease uh, that include worker warburg but are called alpha dystroglycanopathy or, or dystroglycan related muscular disorder, studying these genes that involves only the cochlea, the rest of the inner ear is completely normal. So these are genes polarized toward the cochlea. So studying the connection between the brain and the ear will be 
we don't know yet, but it can be a hint to understand why some patients with the same gene have worker world with phenotype, terrible brain, terrible prognosis, and some other patients, they have milder forms and they are relatively well and they have a better prognosis. So not only we can use to do diagnosis and to, um, um, uh, to do the, the syndromic diagnosis and to establish the prognosis in terms of cochlear implant, uh, I'm speaking broadly about cochlear malformation, but we also can use this appearance to select a bunch of genes, a bunch of pathways that are all involved in the cochlea and tell our expert uh, clinician or geneticist, listen, why, the, why only the cochlea is abnormal? Why these genes, what is the connection between these genes and the brain and the muscle and the eye? So it's something that can be used to understand more other pathology. Um, finally, two tips. When you see these nerves, uh, that when you see three germinal nerve and eight nerves, they go in, in, uh, in the Meckel cave and the Meckel cave that continues with the internal auditory canal, the nerves appear fused together. Look at this. And also this uh, external bulging of the, the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is fused with eight or part of, or part of the eighth nerve. And they go to a canal uh, that includes Meckel cave, and internal auditory meatus, with or without cochlear malformation, this has to be an insult. So don't look for genes. This malformation is due to a prenatal insult. Most of these patients, they have maternal diabetes that has been associated with bacterial association or other stuff. Maternal diabetes can create a lot of problems. But you look something like that, a fusion between trigeminal nerve and uh, a seven or eight, the sometimes the seven is variable. Sometimes the seven is present, sometimes the eight is not present, sometimes there are cochlear malformations, sometimes not. But when you see this but a standard budget of the trigeminal nerve, fusion with seven or and or eight, and one canal uh, between one one um, uh, yeah, uh, canal uh, including Michael K and internal auditory canal, think an insult, don't look for gene. And this is a beautiful paper from Anya Maria Giseman that really produced a lot of beautiful paper on inner ear. And she described the same association. You can see the internal auditory canal uh, and uh, the metal cave fused together and this typical appearance of the trigeminal nerve. Why is that? Because insult, prenatal insults such as the maternal diabetes can impact the formation of specific nerves, including the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth. So there is an embryological explanation but the bottom line is that you see something like that, you think you do not think genetic. And this is a case that uh, we discussed with, with my, my colleague Snia um, uh, um, two days ago. And you can see there is an arachnoid cyst, 39 week old uh, male, an arachnoid cyst, right sensory inner ear loss, completely dysmorphic uh, uh, inner ear. Uh, now, what is that? Is it a common cavity? Is a cochlear hypoplasia? I think it's a common cavity. She thought it was a cochlear hypoplasia. We can discuss a lot about that, but this is completely asymmetrical with another abnormality associated on the same uh, sides. We don't know the, why, what is the origin of the arachnoid cyst, but there are some theories that can be associated with some insults. Uh, also because this can also be just a cyst uh, um, due to adhesion. So what is the malformation? It's not very important to go to the table and, and check for the specific mal malformation if there is no reason. You need to look for the malformation like IP3 or the typical bore cochlear hypoplasia or the typical SOX10 association or the typical pen that's fine. But in this case, not very important. What is important is this is the cause of the deafness, probably the etiology is a prenatal insult because there is also another abnormality and is profoundly asymmetrical looking without other abnormalities in the brain. So these are three suggested reading. Um, this is uh, about the link between inner ear malformation and the rest of the body. Uh, is an editorial that we published with some colleagues. I really need to thank all my colleagues like Ada Siddiqui, uh, Karen Robson, Susan Blazer, Will O'Brien, uh, uh, Ajay, Giacomo Talenti, Lorenzo Pinelli, all these people that give me so many input and really, I really learn a lot from them. And these are two um, uh, papers, one from Senarogo, another from Bernard Linquirk that works at, at uh, King's, uh, that are just a picture a review of uh, all this uh, uh, bunch of malformation that I described, but the spectrum is uh, um, 
now uh, uh, wider and wider every day. So in conclusion, there is a new classification of intraneural malformation. It's based on histology, uh, and uh, you need to use that because it can really help you. There is a spectrum of cochlear hyperplasia. Some of them can be part of mnemonic of specific situation in three types of incomplete partition. And there is a link between the ear, the brain, and the body with characteristic petrous bone appearances, especially, but not only the cochlea, that can help you in looking at syndromic association. Um, I hope I was more clear than this uh, street sign from my region uh, in Campania. And my lectures are on YouTube, if you are interested. There are a lot of teaching lessons, something simple for, for fellow and trainees and don't do very deep research, but uh, um, uh, that's it. And uh, I really hope you, you enjoyed and this was uh, helpful. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Felice. Uh, that was an amazing lecture. I, uh, every time I listen to you, I learn uh, something new. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we've got Maria on the line as well. Um, so I think perhaps we can start the discussion by um, uh, essentially uh, summarizing what protocols do you use, Felice, for pre-cochlear implant patients? Um, do you start with MRI and then do CT if necessary, or do you do both? Um, I mean, certainly in, in my center, we start with an MRI in the first instance, and uh, we, we on the basis of the MRI, we select uh, cases which might need subsequent CT. So we start with an MRI. This is uh, the, exactly how it should be. So, I mean, the MRI is to look at the anatomy and the presence of nerves, because if there are no nerves, you don't do that, and you cannot exclude with CT. And then the CT is the, the true pre-op um, uh, scan, because, of course, you need to look for the bones and you need to look for the anatomical variants. One thing that we start to use now is the flat panel uh, CT that is a combined CT. So we, we, we bother people up in IR, and we do the flat panel that allows us a resolution of 0.1 millimeter, which is critical, especially for the middle ear. So when there are complex malformations also involved in the tympanic cavity, we uh, do use flat panel. Um, at, at the moment, we cannot use uh, with patients under GA, uh, but we use for all the other uh, the other patient uh, with uh, with um, tympanic also problem associated, tympanic cavity problem associated. So how do you select which cases, Felice, would uh, need a CT in addition to an MR? Because sometimes we, Every time uh, they you're not quite them. sure uh, if there is a cochlear aperture uh, present or not, then I think CT might sometimes help in certain cases where you may be able to demonstrate a tiny cochlear aperture which is not seen on MR, in which case you might infer that there might be uh, a thin cochlear nerve uh, or some fibers passing through. Uh, of course, you have uh, well, to look the approach at the, uh, depends by the ENT. I think the approach that yeah. they have is that if they see two nerves, they go in because some cochlear fibers are always yeah. present. So even if we yeah. cannot demonstrate the cochlear nerve, so the MRI is critical to select the patient that will go, especially bilateral sensory mm -hmm. indefinite, that will go to cochlear implant. And then for planning, we do the CT, and there are several publications demonstrating that CT is necessary because otherwise you will not have all the information. So, so do we you do, do CT in all cases? Uh, of... Yes, pre cochlear implant we do in all cases and this is uh, what also has been published. Okay. So yeah. I think it's the practice can be a bit variable because in some centers where they do both adult and pediatric cochlear implants, uh, you may start off with an MRI and uh, do a CT only in select cases if necessary. For instance, if you're suspecting something uh, else going on, if you think the mastoid is small in volume and you really want to uh, delineate the bony anatomy. With regards to the MR protocol, Felice, what, uh, what's your uh, sequence and uh, what's the slice thickness? What's the, the protocol? Do you do direct oblique? sagittals as well as uh, your axials no so what we do at the moment is uh, so the ba the basic sequence as i show is a 3d t2 0 0.6 millimeter in axial and is an isotropic voxel you can reformat uh, it's true that the reformat in this sequence that are called cis or drive or fiesta so steady state uh, heavily weighted t2 
the reformats are not so good as the the acquisition but for for a question of time uh, and because we we do all our scan on the three tesla the prisma is a quite good uh, um, homogeneous field uh, we just do the axial t2 and then we do the the brain now because most of these patients they are under ga we do the whole brain also because as i say there can be abnormality in the brain apart from the abnormality that gives you deafness like a nictus for instance we can have malformation and we want to study the brain the minimum sequence uh, that some other centers do is just an axial t2 of the brain but being the patient of their ga we do all the brain and uh, um, uh, one thing that's important is this is for the inner ear problems. If you have a cholesteatoma, it's different because you need to do a diffusion and you need to do a diffusion in uh, coronal, non-epi, possibly diffusion to look for the cholesteatoma, as you know. The problem is that on three Tesla Siemens, we don't have non-epi diffusion, so we do a multi-shot coronal and axial. So you need to change a bit if you are looking at the middle ear or the inner ear, but uh, unless there is a question of cholesteatoma, yes, no, we just do the 3D T2, 0 0.6 or 0 0.5 millimeters, and the brain. And of course, in case of cochlear implant, we do um, also the CT, as I said. So we have the um, we have a 3D drive sequence on the Philips, uh, one of the Philips magnets, and uh, on the Siemens, we've got a 3D cis sequence. And uh, previously, we, we had a slice thickness of 0.6, in which case we, especially because these, as you said, these children are being scanned under GA and you don't want to call them back and you want to make sure that you get good quality imaging of the of the nerves, we would always uh, do oblique sagittals, uh, one block on each side, because the reformats of the, uh, the 0.5 or 0.6 millimeter uh, slices was not great. So uh, just to be confident that you are seeing a nerve or if you're not seeing a nerve, mm -hmm. we would always do that. More recently, what we've uh, we've optimized some of the sequences, especially the 3D cis sequence, which is now 0.3 uh, and isotropic. So on that, the, the quality of the reformats is excellent. You know, basically it's the which same standard? as it's a which Siemens, uh, it's a new which Siemens magnet. And the yeah, new yeah, 3D yeah. I mean, it depends by how the, point how three the is amazing. set. It depends yeah, on yeah. the panel set. If so, you are I mean, confident, Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, for most people, I would recommend if you're doing a pre-cochlear implant scan, then uh, at least for children, do the oblique sagittals just uh, just in case the axials are not great and you really want to make sure that uh, you see the nerve because they cut the nerves uh, in cross-section. So there's no way you can miss a nerve if you're doing uh, yeah, yeah. oblique yeah. sagittals. Uh, there's uh, another there question any... here, Felicia. Yeah. Sorry, were you saying something? No, no, so if there were other questions. Please. Yes, the, the, the other question I have, there's a question from Faiza Malaysia who says, thank you. Um, uh, dear Felicia, how frequently do you see an isolated enlarged vestibular aqueduct without incomplete partition type 2? Oh, yes, it's quite uh, uh, frequent. Uh, I have to say, because there are, you know, this is described and, 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 and can, can, uh, um, you know, uh, identify a branded, for instance, uh, and normally it's bilateral. One thing is important, first to measure, sometimes if you have a parasagittal, uh, it's better to measure on the parasagittal to be sure that this is enlarged, first of all. Second of all, I have to say, when I, second, I mean, when I see the MR now, after studying all this malformation, often I found a bit of IAPO developed modulus and something that can be called IP2. But it really doesn't matter because uh, the, the the prognosis is the same. It's just uh, you know the genetic abnormalities are are similar. So it becomes uh, have a look to the apical part of the cochlea. But uh, practically it doesn't matter. And despite the complexity of the topic, I try to really uh, maintain a practical um, approach. Sorry, I don't want to go too much over six. No, no, <laughs> that's fine. The There's um, another question. How do you differentiate? cochlear aplasia from common cavity this is uh, from Pulen aslan from turkey yeah so that's the that's uh, what i was showing in the last case and we had some different opinion with my colleague i mean uh, as a general rule uh, you you know if you have uh, uh, you know a common cavity you, you you can see clearly that it's the the the, the cavity with the internal auditory canal 
that should be in the middle more or less if everything is pushed posteriorly then you should call on mr on, on ct is a bit easier but you should call call calibrate the problem I, as i show you the last uh, in the last case is that the the audi capsule was deformed they push backwards so you can have something a bit uh, um uh, misleading but uh, I have to say that the cochlear uh, aplasia is really all the time genetic when it's unilateral. I call it uh, common cavity. But I, I get your point, and I think that is true. This can be difficult. As general rule, if everything is posterior to the internal auditory meatus, should be a cochlear aplasia. But sometimes I report it differently, but I may be wrong. The, another question, Felice, from Turkey, from Yelis Peskovic, is. Uh... Uh -huh. Do you use structured reporting for inner ear malformations? No, the only structured report that I use at the moment is uh, for uh, paranasal sinuses because there is an excellent paper on radiology on uh, by uh, William O'Brien that really you need to take in mind to do not miss anything. But for this, I don't, I don't, I don't use it. I, I keep it short and I try to get to the point. Excellent. I think. Um, uh, the audience is mainly pediatric radiologists, and uh, I don't think many, I'm not sure how many do specialize head and neck uh, in radiology or head and neck imaging in pediatric. But certainly, um, I think, as you said, if you pick up something, you can certainly give clues as to what the underlying diagnosis. In fact, as a radiologist, you might sometimes be the first person to make a diagnosis. You know, just for example, if uh, you have a child who's come in with a newborn with respiratory stress, and um, you are doing a CT for coenal atresia, and you see bilateral bony coenal atresia on a CT. On the same CT, try looking specifically at the internal, uh, at the semicircular canals. And if you see absent canals, you might even see colobomas on that same CT, uh, which would cover the orbits and a bit of the temporal bone. So on the one scan, which is being done for coenal atresia, you can make a diagnosis of Char syndrome. So I yeah. think that the link between the body and the ear is very strong, and uh, and it's it's very important to remember some of the common classic um, uh, imaging phenotypes as you've just uh, described in the lecture. So that was uh, really amazing, Felice. Thank you very much yeah. for enlightening us. Uh, Maria, is there anything you'd like to ask? Uh, I think I've asked enough. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, this evening's webinar. I would like to thank uh, both of you both Felice and Ata for your input and for this brilliant webinar. Uh, this was uh, updated and thorough and very useful for uh, us pediatric radiologists. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, the audience, uh, all of you who chose to spend this hour uh, on uh, the ESPR webinar and uh, hopefully we will uh, see you again in our upcoming ESPR educational activities. Since uh, this is the last webinar for 2020, it is an opportunity to acknowledge the people behind this endeavor, the JASPER community, especially Dr. Pablo Caro Dominguez, who is the thinking mind behind the organization of the webinars, the ESPR board, especially the webmaster, Dr. Ola Quist, who supported this endeavor at the beginning, the ESPR educational committee members and the ESPR task force leaders, which is suggested speakers, topics, moderators, the speakers, including you and moderators themselves, who devoted time and energy for all of us. And last but not least, Mrs. Anka Konchuban, our ESPR office secretary, who is the guardian angel and responsible for the huge secretarial support, the newsletters and the coordinators of the webinars. These webinars, some of these available for ESPR members on our website, are the society's way of saying that during this extraordinary year and for a little while longer, the family of ESPR will stay present and close to each other. Next webinar will occur on Tuesday, January 12th, 2021, at the same hour, given by Professor Makaofia from Sheffield, UK, who will lecture about skeletal dysplasia, what you should know. I do hope that you all mark your calendars and will join us for this important and highly specialized lecture as well. Thank you again from all of us from Heraklion. I personally wish you a nice, safe remaining evening, a warm-hearted Christmas holiday, 
and a healthy, productive, and more carefree new year. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.